Okay, it's kind of interesting how things do come together here. Uh, several, well, for the last month probably, God's been laying on my heart that, that I need to do some teaching on creation. And, uh, and then last week, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but last week was Charles Darwin's birthday, February the 12th, Charles Darwin's birthday. So last Sunday, there were hundreds of churches across the country, about 500 of them, that celebrated Evolution Sunday. Hmm. How does that work? Uh, they had a list on their website, and I looked over the list, and the, the closest one I could find here was in, actually in Decatur. But there was uh, quite a few in the state of Illinois. Now, I did a little research, and it all started about 10 years ago when an atheist by the name of Michael Zimmerman put out a letter, put out a letter to clergy to try to get the clergy to sign this letter. And I'm just going to read you a couple paragraphs from this letter. Um, it says, We, the underside, Christian clergy, from many different traditions, believe that the timeless truths of the Bible and the discoveries of modern science may, may comfortably coexist. We believe that the theory of evolution is a foundational scientific truth. Now, that's an interesting statement, that the theory of evolution is a scientific truth. Theory, what's a theory? Theory, if, according to Webster's Dictionary, is a speculation. It's a conjecture or guesswork. But they're saying that that theory is actually truth, all right? So this is what you're signing to if you sign on to this letter. And it goes on to say, we believe that among God's good gifts are human minds capable of critical thought, and that the failure to fully employ this gift is a rejection of the will of our Creator. We urge school board members to preserve the integrity of the science curriculum by affirming the teaching of the theory of evolution as a core component of human knowledge. So, there have been over 13,000 pastors that have signed that letter, and 577 of those are from the state of Illinois. So I want to ask the question this morning, does what I believe about evolution and creation matter? Does that, does it really matter, you know, what I, what I believe about those things? You know, I've spoken with a lot of people that are kind of confused about that. I've even spoken with other pastors, pastors that I respected, that were like, well, you know, I'm not really too sure about that thing. I'm not sure how that all how that all works out, how that all came about. And to be honest with you, growing up, you know, I heard the Bible stories in church and about creation and all this, and, and then I went to school. I went to public school the first several years, and then uh, starting in fourth year, I went to, went to uh, Christian school. But even at that young age, you know, I heard about evolution, and I'm like, I was, I was confused for, for a long time. Like, how does this all, can we mesh evolution and creation together somehow? Does that all mesh, you know? Because you go to school and you hear about billions of years and millions of years and all this kind of stuff going way back. And how does this all work together? And um, so I was confused about this. Now, this hasn't always been the case throughout history. Uh, up until about 150 years ago, when Charles Darwin wrote the book, The Origin of, or, Origin of Species, most people believed in, in creation. Most people believed, you know, that there was some kind of a God that created things. In America, we've gone from teaching only creation from the Bible to teaching kind of a mixture of creation and evolution to teaching that, you know, it's just strictly evolution and you can't teach uh, creation at all. In fact, if someone believes in, in uh, creation, why, they're some kind of a dumb, dumb dummy. I saw a deal just the other day on Scott Walker. Scott Walker is the governor of Wisconsin. He's probably going to be running for president. And uh, he made some comment about creation. And the media was mocking him because he believes in creation. But there's encouraging news in this. I find it interesting that after years and years of propaganda by the evolutionists, many people still believe in creation. George Barna did a survey last year. In that survey, where they sampled thousands of thousands of people all across America, 42% said they believed God created humans in their present form. 31% believe that humans kind of evolved, but God was somehow involved in the process. God guided the process. 
that 72% of Americans believe that God had some hand in the process of why you are who you are today. Only 19% believe that humans evolved and God had no part in the process. So it tells me after 150 years of promoting evolution, it's largely failing today. Uh, praise God for that. Praise God for that. I want to look this morning briefly about four popular theories on the origin of, of uh, the universe. Not all Christians agree on these different theories. I'm going to look at those four, and then, then I'm going to try to answer the question, does what you believe about creation and evolution really matter? And if it does, why that matters this morning? The first one, of course, is evolution, the, the Big Bang theory, theory that some molecules somehow smashed together and somehow life came about. You know, then the, then the question arises, well, where did the molecules come from? You can follow it all the way back where somewhere, sometime, something had to start. And, um, you know, the problem with evolution is that it's never been proven that something can get better without some better input. It would be like taking and uh, throwing, a, uh, throwing a bomb into a junkyard or stick a dynamite into a junkyard and expect the Lexus to come out. It doesn't happen, you know. It gets worse. It doesn't get better. And uh, that's kind of how evolution would have to work. That out of some kind of pond scum, some little tadpole evolved and turned into a frog and formed into a, a monkey to an ape to you. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't think I came from a monkey. Now, there's evidence of succession within species. Um, I remember when I was a kid, we had dogs. We had German Shepherds, you had Dalmatians, you had, you had about, you know, about a dozen different species of dogs that I can think of. <laughs> Today you got designer dogs, right? There's all kinds of dogs just because of the different breeding processes and stuff. And you can get them in all kinds of different colors. You can get them in small, medium, and large. And uh, there's all kinds. Of, and how's that? It's not evolution. It's selective breeding. We used to do that with pigs. We raised pigs, and, and we'd, we'd save some of the pigs for our breeding program, and we liked the ones with the big hams, you know? And so it was selective, and we do that. But that's not evolution. That's all within the same species. It doesn't jump from one species to another. Um, so the theory of evolution, is what I'm trying to say this morning, is just a theory. It's a theory. Uh, but there's no room for God in that theory. I don't know about you, but I don't have enough faith to believe in that. I just don't have enough faith. But there's another one that is maybe a little bit more believable, and that's theistic evolution. Theistic evolution. And that's that, you know, God is the creator, but he actually used the evolutionary process over billions of years. Now, all these days that Genesis talks about are really just uh, a period of time. A period of time. But that theory really undermines God. It says that the creation that he called good, after each day he said, and it was good. And after the last day he said it was very good. What it's saying is that creation continually keeps to get, getting better. Keeps getting better. I believe he created it perfect. And it continually keeps getting worse. Because sin has been degenerating it ever since. And then there's the third one called the gap theory. The gap theory is, and if you'll take your Bibles and open to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, the gap theory is that there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2 in Genesis chapter 1. Verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Or maybe we could put the gap between verse 2 and verse 3, where verse 3 was, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning. There was the first day. 
So the gap theory says that between those verses there was a gap, a long period of time, and that's a period of time when, when uh, we got all the, where all the fossils come from and all the things um, that, you know, the scientists look at and say, well, you know, this was millions of years ago or billions of years ago or, or whatever it is. There's only one problem with that. There was no death until Adam sinned. Romans 5.12 says, when Adam sinned, sin entered, in, in, entered the entire human race. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. So if there's no death, you can't have fossils without death. It takes something to die to create a fossil. So how, does, how did that happen? Then there's the fourth theory, and that's six 24-hour days of creation. That's what we find in the rest of Genesis chapter 1 down to uh, chapter 2. Let me, let me just read that just to, just to kind of refresh our memory a little bit. We'll start in verse, uh, verse 6 where he starts with the second day. God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds and God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the third day and God said let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth and it was so God made two great lights the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night he also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. Now, let me, let me just pause there for a little bit. I've heard people make the argument that, you know, the creation account can't be true because there was light the first day, created light the first day, but it wasn't until the fourth day that he created the sun, moon, and stars, and we know that we get our light from the sun, moon, and stars, Right? There's another place we get light from. We get light from Jesus Christ. We get light from Jesus Christ. The Bible says that in, the, uh, in Revelation that in the new Jerusalem, there'll be no need for the sun or the stars there because God will be the light and Jesus will be the lamp in that, in that uh, heavenly kingdom. So let's move on. That was the fourth day, the fifth day, verse 20. God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing which which water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, the, live, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all, all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, 
They will be yours for food and all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground. Everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had done, been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating he had done. Okay, let's stop there. Now, I've heard, I've heard the argument that, well, it says here that God created man and woman. Male and female, he created them, right? And then the second chapter talks about how he created Adam. He took dust from the ground and he formed Adam. So I've heard the argument that God must have created a whole bunch of people. And then there was this one guy that he talked about, Adam, that he created. I believe that chapter 2 is actually describing what cha happened in chapter 1. Chapter 2 is describing what happened when God created Adam. Science is proving that out. Because now with DNA testing, they say that they can take DNA, t DNA testing and everybody's DNA can be traced back to one person. We all have that one, that strain of DNA that can go all the way back to Adam from one person that God created in the very beginning. So, well, people say, you know, well, creation can't be true because how do you explain all the fossils that uh, are millions of years old? Well, have you ever thought about how a fossil forms? Evolutionists tell you, you know, fall, uh, something dies and over a period of years and years it's covered up by sentiment and, and then uh, it forms a fossil, right? Have you ever seen an animal killed beside the road? How long does it last? A few days, maybe a few weeks at the most. It's soon uh, eaten by scavengers, scattered around or rotted. Uh, for something to create, for a fossil to create, be created, has to be covered quickly. Something has to be covered very quickly. And uh, how would that happen? Only by the flood. I think the key to understanding creation is to understand the flood. The creation doesn't make sense unless we put the flood right in there with it. Why do they find seashells on mountains? In 1953, Edmund Hillary got to 26,000 feet on Mount Everest and he found seashells. How did they get there? Only one thing explains that, and that's the flood that happened during, Noah, during Noah's time. You know, the evolutionist says a little water over a long period of time. The Bible teaches a lot of water over a short period of time. Several years ago, had the opportunity to go to the Grand Canyon. What an amazing, amazing thing to see. Huge. The evolutionist says it was a lot of water over a long, or a little water over a long period of time that cut that gorge. But if you think about what would have happened when the flood happened, when everything was covered, said all the mountains were covered, and all the water, says the, the, the water from the deep came up, and the water from the heavens came down. And if you've ever seen a big downpour, and you see what it can do to to, with erosion to fields and so forth. You see that it can move a lot of stuff in a short period of time. In uh, 1980, I remember this. Some of you are too young to remember this, but when Mount St. Helens erupted, it was an explosion the size of 33,000 atomic bombs. It buried miles of veg vegetation, caused mudslides that carved canyons out of rock. This happened in hours, not millions of years. Did you know that today you can go there and there's already coal being formed from all that vegetation that was buried? This was, this is just in a few years, 40, what, 40 years, 30 years, that coal is already being formed. But the, the scientists tell us that takes millions of years for that to happen. You can go there and you can see layers that were laid down in a matter of minutes. They look a lot like the layers in the Grand Canyon, 
but they were laid down in a matter of minutes, not millions of years. So if you take the flood into account, everything starts making sense. And people say, well, you know, what about carbon dating? Doesn't that prove that the earth is old? Now, what is carbon dating? Carbon dating measures the amount of carbon in an object. So they take a bone and they say, you know, there's a certain amount of carbon left in this object, so it must be so many years old. And uh, the problem with that is the scientist assumes that the carbon levels in the, in the world have always been exactly the same as they are today. But you have to remember, before the flood, life was totally different. It was a totally different time. The Bible says that there was no rain before the flood, and yet things grew. It says there was a mist that went forth and watered the earth. There was no rain until the time that the flood happened. People had never seen rain before. I picture it as like a greenhouse. It was, it was a, just a greenhouse, a perfect environment where things could grow. People lived to 900 years old. It was a perfect environment. There would have been a lot more carbon at that time. So that throws their whole carbon idea um, out the window. Think about all the vegetation that would have grown. If a tree has a perfect environment to grow and grow and grow, how big would they get? All that material was, was buried by the flood. That's where we get all our oil and coal today from the things that were buried back then. People say, well, don't dinosaurs prove that the earth is millions of years old? And, and you know, I've had these conversations with people. In fact, we had a couple that was coming here uh, several years ago, and they were, they were getting ready to join the church, going through class 101. And, and in, our, in our class, in our statements of belief, uh, we, we say, you know, we believe um, that God created the universe in six 24-hour days, and that before he created the universe, nothing except God existed. And we give the references there. For it. And so we're going through this class, and this lady says to me, she says, well, I believe in dinosaurs, though. You know, I believe that there were dinosaurs. I said, well, I do, too. And, uh, but how can I do that? You know, when the Bible doesn't say that there were dinosaurs there, um, but if we, the, the reason it doesn't is because the word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841. And uh, the Bible was translated into English in 1611. But there are other words that probably refer to dino dinosaurs. If we look at uh, a couple of verses here, it says, look at the behemoth, probably referring to a dinosaur. And it describes it, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins, what power in his muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like rods of iron comes from the book of Job. Job is considered to be the oldest book in the Bible. He's describing something that, that he had seen. And uh, on the, uh, in verse 21 of our text there in, in Genesis 1, it says, God created the great creatures of the sea, possibly describing uh, some dinosaurs. Um, in another verse there in Job, it says, can you pull in the Levi Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope. Any hope of subduing him is false. The mere sight of him is overpowering. I believe that those great creatures which were reptiles didn't survive after the, after the flood because the environment was totally different. It was much har harsher. So you might say, well, that's all interesting stuff, but, you know, I'm not sure. Does what I believe about creation and evolution really matter. You know, I know a lot of people that would be like, like, I like God, I like Jesus, I, I think the church is pretty cool, but I, I want to kind of hang on to this evolution thing. I want to kind of hang on to this thing that I was taught in school. Can we just kind of eliminate the first 11 chapters of the Bible? If we can just kind of eliminate that, well, I'll just go with the rest of it. Or maybe I'll just go with the New Testament. I kind of like the New Testament, I'll just stick with that. Here's the problem. Let's look at what some of the other writers in the Bible had to say. Did other Bible characters believe in creation? Let's look at Moses. God is giving instructions through Moses to the children of Israel. 
in Exodus chapter 20, he's giving them the law on Mount Sinai, right? And God says this through Moses, says, For in six days the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. People say, well, you know, but those days are, it's just referring to a period of time. It could have been thousands of years or millions of years, but there's a problem with that because it says, in Genesis it says, the evening and the morning were the first day. Now why would he put that in there? I think he put that in there because he knew we'd come to a day when people would say, well, it's just a period of time. But if it's an evening and a morning, that's one 24-hour period. That's one 24-hour period. That's what Moses believed. Look at this verse in Exodus as well. He repeated it. it says, the Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. Again, referring to six days. So what about some other writers? What about David? Let's look at what David had to say in Psalm 148. It says, Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. Okay? He believed in creation. So what I'm saying is, if you don't believe in the creation, it undermines everything else in the Bible. Let's look at Solomon. Solomon said, this only have I found. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. God created man. What about the prophets? Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah says, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. So Isaiah believed that God created everything. So again, you might say, well, that was Old Testament guy, you know, and those guys weren't too smart. They weren't too educated. Let's go to the New Testament. But what did Jesus say? He says, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Jesus believed it. So if you don't believe in creation, you undermine the whole Bible. See, Satan knows if he can undermine the belief in creation, then he can undermine your belief in the writings of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, he can undermine your belief in David, in Solomon, in the prophets. He can undermine your belief in the New Testament. What did the New Testament writers have to say? Every one of them had something to say about creation. See, if you don't believe in creation, then there is no original sin. If there's no original sin, then there's no need for a Savior. And Satan knows that, and he's trying to use that to undermine what God is doing. You know, people say, well, you know, well, how old is the earth really? God gave us a timeline. We can go back and we can, we can add together the length of days of the people in Genesis chapter 5. And we can see how long it was up until the time of the flood. You can, you can go to Adam. You can see how long it was before Seth was born. And you add those, those numbers all together. And I did that. And it was 1,656 years from the time of Adam until the flood came. And then we can go to the New Testament. He gives us the lineage from, from all the way from Noah all the way up to Jesus' time. And we know exactly how long that time frame was. And we can discover how old the earth is. It's not billions of years. It's only thousands of years. Turn with me now to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to show you what Peter has to say about this. Second Peter chapter 3 starting in verse 1. Peter says, uh, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. He's like, hey, I want you to use your brain here a little bit, all right? I want to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. 
Above all, you must understand that in the last days, that's the days we're living in right now, I believe, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, anything, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed, talking about Noah's flood. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. What's he saying? He's saying if you don't believe in the supernatural creation and the supernatural flood, how in the world can you believe that Jesus is coming back? How can you really believe that, that he's coming back again? That the trumpet's going to sound, what I've been talking about on Wednesday nights, the trumpet is going to sound sometime very soon, and Jesus is coming back again. He says in the last days there'll be scoffers who say, you know, this has been going on for billions of years, and it's going to keep going on for billions of years, and this is not going to happen. It's going to happen, folks. Does it matter? Now, you might still have your opinion this morning about creation and so forth, but I encourage you to do your own research. Check it out yourself. Do like Peter says here. Stimulate you to wholesome thinking. The scientists try to tell us that, you know, we're just dumb, dumb dummies that aren't, don't have critical thinking. I invite you to critically think about what you've been taught in school. Critically think about what the Bible teaches. I put a website on your notes there, answersingenesis.org. I encourage you to go to that site. There's tons and tons of research on that site from a scientific point of view. Do your own research. Check it out yourself because this morning I'm here to tell you it does matter. It does matter what you believe about creation because if you don't believe in creation, in the flood, and you can't believe in the other authors of the Bible. You might as well throw them all out. Because they all believed it. They all wrote about it. They believed it. Do you believe it this morning? Let's stand. Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you that you are the creator. And you made a, a way for us uh, because sin entered into the world. You made a way of salvation for us because you love us and you care about us. We thank you for that this morning. Father, we, we just uh, pray that you would help us to continue to grow and learn in knowledge. You gave us minds, yes, you did, to think. And as we think about these things, I pray that you would help us to Guide us to the truth. Guide us to the truth, God. That your, your word is true. We can count on your word. When nothing else seems like we can count on, we can always count on your word. And we thank you for that today, God. Pray your blessing on each one that's here today. Guide and direct them throughout this week. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.